Hi all, welcome back to Cardiovascular Anatomy with Professor Howard. So last video focused on the external anatomy of the heart, including the layers and coverings of the heart and the great vessels. So now it's time to transition to the internal anatomy of the heart. So what we're looking at is a frontal section uh, of the heart as it would sit in the body. So that's what this little inset over here is showing you right there. And so what I'm going to do now is first zoom in on this top illustration to show you some features of the illustrated heart and then we'll go ahead and look at the cadaver heart at the bottom of the picture to compare and contrast because obviously scientific illustration is great and everything but it doesn't necessarily exactly reflect uh, what the structures look like in real life especially in a plastinated dissected heart like the one you see below. So with that let's get started. So first, I'm going to try and zoom in on this guy. Nope. I would really like it if it would just let me magnify. That would be great. Okay. And then let's shrink that a little bit. Okay. So here we have a frontally sectioned heart, and that's going to show you all of the chambers as well as some of the valves. So here, and I'm going to switch to a, a brighter color so we can have some contrast here. So the atria are the top two chambers, and I showed you them from the outside, but it bears looking at the inside as well. So I am circling the right atrium, which receives blood that's oxygen poor from both the superior and inferior vena cava. And then over here on the left side, we have the left atrium, and that's going to receive blood from the pulmonary veins, which are paired. There are two on each side, but you're only seeing the left-hand side ones in this picture. The right-hand side ones you would see if you flipped this image around and showed the other side of the heart. So the atria are thin-walled, as you can see, so the wall here is really thin. They're still made of cardiac muscle, it's just that they don't have to overcome much resistance because most ventricular filling, so with the way blood gets into the ventricles, is passive, meaning that they just fill up naturally. The atria are only really there to fill up the last little bit of blood coming into them, um, and so they don't need to be especially muscular for that reason. So the walls are fairly thin. Now, uh, some distinguishing features of the atria. The, the left atrium is actually relatively unremarkable. So blood is coming in from the lungs, it's oxygen rich, and then it just fills up the left ventricle, and then at the last minute, the left atrium is gonna squish the last little remaining bit of blood down into that ventricle. The right atrium has some interesting features, and one of them you can actually see um, and that's this little guy right here, and this is the fossa ovalis. Now, one thing I'm not super thrilled about this image is that the fossa ovalis is positioned a little bit strangely here, and I know why they've done it. They've done it so that you can see it. However, um, in reality, the fossa ovalis is on the interatrial septum. So septum means divider, and interatrial means between the two atria. So the interatrial septum is the divider between the two atria, and really it's hidden back here behind these two great vessels. This image makes it look like the interatrial septum is facing posteriorly. It's not. They kind of have smushed the heart a little bit so that you can see the fossa ovalis. So just take that with a grain of salt. The fossa ovalis is a structure that exists. It just doesn't look quite like this in real life. So what is the fossa ovalis? Well, it is a leftover of a structure from fetal circulation. So fossa, you may remember from bones, means dent or depression, and ovalis just means oval-shaped. So as you can see, it fits the bill, right? It's an oval-shaped dent in the wall of the interatrial septum. But that doesn't really tell you anything about what it's for or where it originated. So what the fossa ovalis is, as I mentioned, is a leftover of fetal circulation. So the leftover structure, or the structure that it's a leftover of... All right, I'm back. Sorry about that. I had to pause to answer a question. As I was saying, uh, the structure that the fossa ovalis is a leftover of is called the foramen oval. Let me... which just means oval hole. And if you're thinking that that sounds familiar, you would be correct. Remember the foramen oval is also a hole in the skull. 
So this is one of those places where the Latin name for something is basically just a name for what it looks like or what it's shaped like. So um, this is not the foramen ovale of the skull, obviously. The foramen ovale is a bypass in the fetal heart that allows blood from the left and right sides of the heart to mix. And the reason for that is if you think about being a fetus, the fetus is getting all of its oxygen requirements in the blood met by the placenta, not by the fetal lungs, which are A, not ventilating, and B, still forming, right? So if that's the case, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense for a fetus to send any blood to its pulmonary circuit. So uh, in order to bypass that, you have this hole that allows oxygen-poor blood and oxygen-rich blood on either side of the heart to mix. This hole closes at birth when the fetus takes its first breath, or the neonate rather. Um, it's called a neonate once it's out, newborn. Um, so and it closes due to pressure changes in the heart. So it turns out breathing and ventilating creates pressure changes in the thorax and pressure changes in the heart, which pull that little flap closed and then it seals over. So the fossa ovalis is a leftover of that. Speaking of leftovers of fetal circulation, there's another one visible here, and that is this guy, which is the ligamentum arteriosum. So the ligamentum arteriosum used to be a little passage called the ductus arteriosus. And the ductus arteriosus is another bypass that allows oxygen poor and oxygen rich blood to mix. So it allows oxygen, um, excuse me, it allows blood to pass between the aorta and the pulmonary trunk. So when that goes away, again, due to pressure changes in the heart as a result of the neonate taking its very first little baby breath, um, it collapses. And then the tunica adventitia of that little attachment just stays behind and forms this ligament right here that we call the ligamentum arteriosum. So even though, you know, we were all fetuses and neonates a long time ago, we have this evidence of uh, differences in fetal circulation left over in our hearts, which I think is pretty neat. Side note about the fossa ovalis specifically, um, because the foramen oval closes basically during labor and delivery, um, so it starts closing then and then it really gets going when the, the neonate takes its first breath, um, a lot of infants are born with a heart murmur. And that's because the fossa ovalis is not completely sealed over, which means that there's a little bit of blood making its way through with every neonatal heartbeat. And this is a piece of information that often scares new parents pretty badly, and, and for good reason. You know, no one wants to hear that their infant has a heart murmur, but this typically goes away fairly early in neonatal development and is not a problem that persists. So in most cases, nothing to be afraid of there. Okay, so let's move on to other features of the heart. And we're also going to look at the valves um, in this presentation in a little bit more detail. Uh, both from this view and from the top view where you can see a little bit more detail of them, so um, stay tuned for that as well. So down here we have the ventricles. So this one is the right one, and this one is the left one. Separating the ventricles from each other is a muscular wall called the interventricular, I'm gonna run out of room there, interventricular septum. So septum means divider or wall, and interventricular means between the ventricles. So it's just literally a wall between the two ventricles, that's all it is. It does contain some cool stuff, but none of that stuff is stuff that you can see in this particular dissection of the heart. So, obviously, from our view, left and right are reversed, right? So when you're thinking about the left and right-sidedness of the heart, you need to turn your brain around and think about patient left and right versus your own left and right. So um, that's one thing that is, is good to keep track of and be aware of when you're 
assigning left and right to things in the heart, just make sure that you're not um, using your own left and right because that doesn't apply to the heart as you're looking at it in a patient, which is also how you look at it in images that you'll be quizzed on. Another way to be sure that you are correctly telling left from right in the heart, and this is a handy trick for, for looking at the heart from all angles, is to note the wall thickness. So the left ventricle has a much thicker wall than the right. See that? And that's because the left ventricle has uh, a lot more resistance to work against. So uh, in the arterial system there is considerable resistance, uh, resistance meaning resistance to flow, and that is because the left ventricle has to beat hard enough to effectively eject blood up your ascending aorta up to all the structures in your head and arms and also down all the way to all of your extremities. So that has to beat pretty hard and as those blood vessels uh, branch and branch and branch they also get smaller and smaller and smaller. So you're forcing liquid through an increasingly small series of tunnels which also creates resistance to flow. So for that reason your left ventricle has to be beefier than the right because it has more resistance to overcome. So if you're looking at two chambers and you're looking at an angle of the heart that you're unfamiliar with, but you notice that one of the two ventricles has a significantly thicker wall, that is going to be the left ventricle. So even if it appears to be on the right for some reason, you can use that wall thickness to make that designation. Okay, so that's how to tell the left and right ventricles from each other. So assuming you can do that, you can also decide which valve you're looking at. So over here, on the left side, we have the left atrioventricular valve. I'm going to abbreviate that AV valve because I have limited room to write here. It's also called the bicuspid valve. And it's also called the mitral valve. <laughs> So this is one of those pesky things in anatomy that has three names. Um, left atrioventricular refers to its position both on the left side and between the atria and the ventricles. Bicuspid refers to the fact that the valve has two cusps or flaps. And mitral refers to the fact that for some reason somebody thought this valve resembled a mitre M-I-T-R-E, excuse me. Um, a mitre is the hat that the Pope wears. That's what that thing is called. So someone looked at that valve and was like, aha, Pope hat. Um, I respectfully disagree. I don't see a Pope hat in there at all. But um, you'll often find that Latinate names in anatomy uh, relate to <laughs> Roman Catholicism. Uh, probably because of the shared language and the prevalence of that particular creed uh, in the world, basically. So um, there's a lot of little like small things like mitral valves sprinkled throughout A&P terminology that refer to uh, Catholic stuff. It's just a, a weird overlap. So that's that valve, and I'll show you the top view of that a little bit later. Over here on the right-hand side, we have the right AV valve. It has two names, so slash tricuspid. So tricuspid means it has three valve cusps, not two, um, and right AV refers to its position on the right hand side between the right atrium and the right ventricle. So you may be noticing that these valves appear to have an attachment point, and that's true. So if you look at the interior surfaces of the ventricles, you're going to see these sort of ropey bars of muscle. And these serve a couple different purposes. One of them um, is to allow there to be space inside of the ventricles for blood to fill, but still have enough muscle tissue present to contract and expel that blood effectively. So it's a little bit of a trade-off. Um, and the other is of course to extend into these specific structures that I'm outlining here and these are called papillary muscles. So 
So papillary muscles, uh, papilla means nipple. So anything vaguely nipple shaped in anatomy and physiology is called the blah, blah, blah papilla or the papillary something or other. So papillary muscles means nipple like muscles, which, okay, kind of. Um, and these are sort of finger like projections of muscle that attach to these stringy ligaments. I'm going to move my epic pen over here. And the stringy, stringy ligaments also have a name. These are the tendinous cords, or the Latin version is cordae tendineae, so E-A-E, -E. it's a fun spelling. So these are literally your heartstrings. Yes, I know that's an expression that people use, pull in your heartstrings, uh, to refer this to something that's emotionally compelling, but you actually do have heartstrings and they have nothing to do with emotions, but rather the integrity of your valves. So when the ventricles are contracting, and by the way, they do so at the same time, they are pushing blood up and the blood needs to go through these semilunar valves. So the pulmonary one is in the front here. And then uh, this red arrow that's kind of ducking behind, this would be going through the aortic semilunar valve. So these valves need to open while the AV valves remain closed. But the pressures generated by the left and right uh, ventricles are, pr are pretty high, the left especially. So one thing you don't want to have happen is for the uh, tricuspid and bicuspid valves to blow inside out and have blood regurgitate back into the respective atria. That is not ideal. So how do you hold those valves shut while allowing enough pressure to build to open the semilunar valves? And the answer is the papillary muscles and the tendinous cords. So the papillary muscles tense up and they pull on the tendinous cords and instead of, they don't, okay, so let me back up. I want to point out a common misconception before I continue, that's why I paused, and that is this. The valves themselves, the cusps, they don't close by any muscular action. What happens is blood pushes on them and pushes them towards each other. So blood pressure changes in the heart are what close the valves. There is no sphincter, there is no muscular action that actively closes them. They close passively due to pressure changes. However, in order for them to be held shut, the papillary muscles tense as the ventricle is contracting, and that holds the valves closed while pressure builds enough to open the semilunar valves. So it's not a matter of the papillary muscles and cords shutting the valves actively, but rather they are holding the valves shut while blood pushes against the valve. So that's what those are there for. Okay, so now let's move down to the cadaver heart and we can compare what we just saw with what it looks like on a real heart, which is to say not a cutesy cartoon like the one seen here. Oh, before we do that, I forgot about this wonderful image. Um, not only is it beautifully lit, but also it shows the papillary muscles and tendinous cords in C2 very nicely. So the papillary muscle is here. Let me just give it a nice little outline there. And then all of these beautiful things are the tendinous cords. So, as you can see, they do actually exist. So let's move over here and check out the cadaver heart. So uh, this is a normal heart, which is to say it's, it's not pathological in any way. So I see no evidence visually that this heart uh, was the cause of this individual's death. Um, so we can see all the same stuff as we can on the other one. So you can see that the left ventricle has a really nice thick wall. Um, the right ventricle, of course, has a thin one. In this one, one of the papillary muscles has been cut off, but you can still see it. And you can see one, two, three very nice papillary muscles there, as well as the tendinous cords, which I'm outlining here. And then the valve cusps attached to them. We can also see very nicely the valve cusps, one, two, three of the pulmonary semilunar valve, because this right here is the pulmonary trunk. Um, and then you can see the left pulmonary artery. 
I'm just abbreviating, abbreviating as I talk because I've already written many of these terms out. So if you're wondering what uh, LPA means, it means left pulmonary artery. And of course, you can follow along with labeled images from your book if you like. Other things we can see, of course, the interventricular septum is right here. And we can't really see the interatrial septum or the fossa ovalis. As I mentioned, that uh, illustration up above here is a little bit inaccurate from that perspective. Um, so here we have the right atrium. And this little flappy is, of course, the right auricle. And then all we can see of the left, left atrium is the left auricle, because most of the left atrium is visible from the back side of the heart. Okay, and then if we move a little bit upward, which I can't do while my illustrations are intact, so let's just erase those and move up, um, we can see the superior vena cava. Here is the rachiocephalic trunk. That makes this one the left subclavian. And then this little guy right here is the left common carotid. And this is the ascending aorta and the aortic arch right there. So that is the internal anatomy of the heart front to back. Um, the only piece of the puzzle that is missing um, that is not pictured here or really anywhere very well on but it is on your list is a structure called the moderator band. Um, so we include this because it's really obvious on the sheep and pig hearts that we dissect but because we're not meeting in person this term I can't show you one of those. So to describe what the moderator band is to you it's a specific band of muscle. You can actually see the stub of it cut off right here. So let me just make this a little bit bigger. So the moderator band is a stub of muscle that connects the interventricular septum to the outer wall or the lateral wall of the right atrium. So the moderator band um, is made of cardiac muscle and it's there to put tension on the wall of the right ventricle, um, both to help coordinate its contraction with the contraction of the or excuse me, wall of the right ventricle, both to help coordinate its contraction with that of the left ventricle, but also to help overstretching, so to prevent the right ventricle wall from overstretching during filling. Um, so it's both a coordinator and a stretching preventer. So it would look like that, like this little blue outline I've made here. Okay, and that completes the internal anatomy of the heart. Uh, so in the next video, I will show you a little bit more about the valves. But in the meantime, if you're curious about the valves, I do go into detail on those in the um, lecture PowerPoint. So have a look there and you should see, be able to see the, the cusp differences and the differences in how they fill with blood from the semilunar valve perspective or how the tendinous cords hold them shut from the AV valve perspective. All right, so I thank you for your attention as always, and I will see you in the next video.